So I would like to thank everyone for joining us again. Uh, my name is Lori George and I am a Small Farms Local Foods Educator with the University of Illinois Extension. My office is located in Mount Vernon, Illinois. And with me today will be speaking is James Thury. Hello, James. Yeah, hi. Hi, Lori. I'm, I'm James Thury. I'm also a local food system small, small farm educator and I'm based in Kankakee, Will, and Grande counties. Those are called counties or counties that are close to Cook County, which is Chicago. Pleased to have all of you. All right. So once we get started, James, you want to go ahead and get us started? Yes. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Again, um, today we're going to be talking about this crop that everybody loves and this crop that should everybody should be planting so easy to grow so let me go to the next slide yes and garlic is a member of the onion family the lily family and it's been grown for more than five thousand years before christ was born the ancient uh, chinese have records of growing this crop and besides being a food, research has also shown that it is a medicinal crop. And it is uh, arising from the ingredient, which you see written there, alicin, that's the primary compound in garlic. And it, is, uh, it does uh, confer some medicinal properties to us. Production in the U.S. has risen from 6,000 acres in the 80s to, to more than four times. It's about 26,000 uh, acres currently. And the U.S. is the world's largest importer of garlic from China, Argentina, and Mexico. So this crop is suited to small acreage because it adds diversity to whatever else you're growing it's it can be on the side there alongside other crops that you're growing and there are the advantages that we'll be talking about later garlic has what is uh, referred to as biological elasticity because it is highly adaptable to grow in many areas of the world, from the tropics to the temperate. And actually, it's suitable to be grown anywhere in the United States. The largest producer of uh, garlic in the US is California. And there are smaller acreages in Oregon, Nevada, Washington, and New York. Half of what is produced in the United States is sold in fresh market. It's in uh, farmers markets and places like those. And half is dehydrated. And the question there about why bother with this crop is because some people say, I don't need to be growing it. It's a very cheap crop. And actually it's very cheap when you go to buy it. It's not one of the most expensive uh, food items, commodities to buy. And it also keeps well. However, it grows easily, really easily. Why not grow your own? And there is something about when you grow your own, that garlic is in quotes green, very fresh and sweeter versus the ones that you buy. Indeed, there is some person who has written an article in the United Kingdom who has said it's almost a crime to not grow garlic. Okay, so what we're going to talk about today will cover a lot of things. And so because there is so much information when, when it comes to garlic, that it would be almost impossible to include like all the cultivars and, and all that. So we're going to give the basics for what, uh, what you need to know for garlic so you can get started or some uh, additional detailed information concerning some of the garlic varieties 
that do well in Illinois. So we'll talk about terminology and the cultivars specifically for Illinois, but that doesn't mean that if you are from out of state that these cultivars cannot be grown. So we'll talk about that. Site selection, crop rotations, timing of planting, soil, and everything else that has to do with the cultural components of growing garlic, as well as the use of cover crops, all the way down to harvesting, curing, and storage. Uh, if you are going to store for use, personal use, or whether you're going to store to be used next year. So let's start a little bit about the terminology first. So we're all kind of on the same page. So garlic uh, differs from onion as the garlic produces a number of small structures called cloves, rather than one large structure as with an onion. Each garlic bulb contains a dozen or more cloves covered with a thin white skin called a tunic. So throughout this webinar, you'll hear different terminology. So when we start talking about hard neck, hard neck garlic produces woody, a woody flower stalk and clusters of bulbils, or what some people call top sets or garlic seeds. Hard necks produce underground bulbs made up of a few large cloves and yield best when planted in the fall. Research shown has shown that yields will increase if the flower stalks are removed before the bulbils form. Hard necks are more flavorful and cloves are bigger and easier to peel than with the soft necks. The hard necks prefer the cold winters and long cool springs of more northern climates, hardiness zones about four uh, or lower do well with that. Soft neck garlics have a flexible stem and leaves that can be braided. These bulbs have more individual cloves and a higher yield than hard neck. Generally, they're better adapted to a wider range of climates and can be spring planted with more success than spring planted hard neck varieties. They do well in hardiness zones five and above. And depending on who you talk with, the soft neck garlic lack the subtle flavor differences that are generally found in the hard neck cultivars. Soft necks are generally found in the grocery stores and it has the best storage life and they're easier to braid. Soft neck garlics are well adapted to the more temperate climate of the south and because they do not bolt easily, they can flourish through the erratic temperatures of the southern winters. Cloves. Each segment of a garlic bulb is called a clove. There can be anywhere from 8 to 20 cloves in a single bulb, depending on the cultivar. Each planted clove will produce a new bulb that consists of 5 to 10 cloves. These cloves, when grown to maturity, will produce the same traits as the mother plant, meaning that it's going to be a vegetative propagation rather than sexual propagation. This can create problems throughout the years if you're saving the bulbs to replant, as the virus and diseases can be transferred from the mother plant to the cloves themselves. The bulb is a cluster of individual cloves. Garlic grows from individual cloves that are broken off from the whole bulb. The scapes, the scape is the flower stalk and it can be twisted or coiled. Uh, generally, the hard neck cultivars have this trait rather than the soft neck. As the bulbils or the garlic seeds are formed, the scapes will straighten out. Scape production takes energy away from the plant when the bulbs are forming, which will result in smaller cloves. Many people look for scapes to buy in the spring, and many are sold at farmer's markets and they can have a high profit potential for those growers. Harvest the scapes either by cutting them or breaking them off when they're about all oh, 10 inches long, uh, generally after the stem starts to loop or form a circle as you see in the picture. Uh, that's when they're gonna be tender and before the flower forms. The bulbils or the top sets are about the size of a popcorn kernel and they can be eaten or planted, but they generally, if you plant these, they'll take two to three years to produce a full-size bulb from the bulbil. 
When the bulbils are used as seed garlic, meaning that these little guys will be planted in the garden, much like you do seed potatoes, and they're planted in the fall, it will produce a small single cloved garlic bulb the following year. These small single garlic bulbs should be planted again in the following fall and the results should be a fully developed bulb the next year. True garlic seeds are about the size of an onion seed and are only produced by the hard neck varieties as they produce the flowering structures. However, these seeds will not come back true to form and once it reaches maturity, it will be different than what the mother plant was. Last one I wanna talk about is elephant garlic. Now, elephant garlic is not really a true garlic, but it's a type of leek that produces very large cloves, often only three or four cloves per bulb. It can produce a large sea stalk that you can cut and use for ornamental purposes if you want. The more tender, fleshy lower portion of the seed stalk is also prized as a stir fry vegetable. Flavor is milder than garlic and tastes more like an onion rather than a garlic. Elephant garlic grows under the same conditions as regular garlic. So let's talk a little bit some of the cultivars that are available. First I'll talk about the hard necks and then we'll talk a little bit about the soft necks. So each garlic cultivar has its own cultivation requirements and to the discriminating palate particular flavors. So each person will say this one tastes good, the other one may say it this one doesn't taste as doesn't have the flavor that it's supposed to. Most important traits are determined by the location of where you're growing it, the soil that you're growing it in, and the climate in your area. There was a study done in 2005 by Dr. Volk and David Stern at the Garlic Seed Foundation looking at 10 cultivars, both hard neck and soft neck, and they found that the size and color of the garlic when you harvest may be different than what is proclaimed on the label. Overall, you should try different varieties in your specific area to see which provides the best personal taste if you're growing for uh, personal consumption and if you're selling it in the marketplace, which one your customers like best. So some of the hard neck cultivars produced uh, the reproductive scapes. So these are called the Rocumbles uh, garlics. These are the most widely grown variety that you see up on the screen. It has robust true garlic flavor. It has loose skins and are easy to peel. Bulbs are generally uh, large with about eight to 12 cloves. Don't store, uh, don't, these don't store as long as the porcelain uh, uh, cultivars that I'll be talking about in a minute. Another cultivar is the French, eight to 10 cloves. Uh, this is winter hardy. The Killarney Red, they're easy to grow. It does well in a variety of soil conditions and in colder winter areas. The short storing life though of these Killarney Reds is about two to three months. Spanish Roja Northwest Heirloom Garlic. This was brought into the North, Northwest Oregon area before 1900, so it's considered an heirloom garlic. This does better in cold winter gardens, but not so well in the warmer winter areas. Average is about oh, 11 cloves per bulb. These don't store very well, maybe four to six months and the Carpathians. It's a good size bulb, maybe about oh, two and a half inches in diameter, has about eight to nine cloves, but again, uh, it's a hard neck and so it doesn't store very well. The next ones are gonna be called the porcelains, and this is the one that has music. Now, if you look in on the internet, it's either music, M-U-S-I-C or M-U-S-I-K. So the spelling is different, but they're both the same. Music is derived from a German extra hardy cultivar. It has big cloves and they're easy to peel. Generally get about four to six large cloves. They store well, well about nine months to a year. They're very cold tolerant. This is what I grow in my garden when I lived in the upper peninsula of Michigan. They grew very well. Next one is Georgian Crystal, which grows well in the northern states. It has very good yields and size. 
The next type of hard neck cultivars are going to be the purple stripes. These are known for their colored papers and features, uh, purple stripes and splotches. You can see through the papers there. And they'll, that will vary. The color is going to vary depending on the weather and the variety. So they average about 8 to 12 inches long. They're crescent-shaped cloves. Uh, second one is Persian star. It's a thick bulb wrapped, uh, streaked with purple. You can store those for about six months. Purple glazier and another one called Siberian does very well in very cold winter environments. So if you're way up north or maybe in Canada, uh, those two do well for you, Purple Glacier and Siberian. The Marbles Purple Stripes, the Metechis, these can handle cold northern climates as well as warmer summer climates. They're large cloves, easy to peel, long storing garlic. May take extra attention when they're curing, so you may need to spend a little bit more time with them during the curing process, but because they tend to easily absorb moisture. So we'll talk about that a little bit later during the presentation. You know, there's over 100 cultivars available from mail order sources. So when you're talking about either hard neck or soft neck, you need to be able to do your research for your area, your climate, your soil, and your personal tastes. So another thing to keep in mind is that garlic can be susceptible to viruses. So make sure when you purchase either the hard neck or soft neck that you purchase from a certified disease-free source. You can buy from local garden stores or purchased via mail order. Grocery store garlic has been treated to prevent sprouting and may not be a good choice for planting. Uh, and we'll talk about using healthy cloves uh, and disease and injuries a little bit later. So let's talk a little bit about some of the soft neck cultivars. Most of the soft neck garlic are productive and least problematic. They can have early maturing varieties with smaller cloves over the hard neck, but they can produce up to twice as many per plant. These soft necks can be hard to peel, a little bit harder than the hard necks. They mature faster than the hard neck. They're adaptable to many climates. Most commercial growers grow soft neck as they can adapt to a wide range of growing conditions and soils. The soft necks rarely produce scapes, so most of the plant's energy will be directed into bulb development rather than reproductive. So the first one is the artichoke cultivars, and the, and the, the first one uh, is called Ichilium red. This is hardy enough to overwinter in the north, but can do well in southern gardens. This can produce anywhere from 10 to 20 cloves on, on three inch diameter bulbs. Has a long storage life, about eight to nine months, if properly cured and stored. They're good all purpose garlic. Grocery store garlic, uh, California white and California early are artichoke cultivars. Uh, California early are vigorous and they're productive, but they do not set the bow bills on the top. Artichokes are ready to harvest earlier in the season. The second one is silver skin of the soft neck cultivars. And these are the most popular garlics for braiding as the garlic necks are pliable, they're smooth and shiny. They can store for 12 months or longer if cured properly. And the bulbs can have about, eight, uh, about you know, 12 to 20 cloves on them. James? Yes, thank you. So the site selection is clearly very important. And just like for any other vegetable, you want well-drained soil to avoid the soil-borne diseases. And as we shall see later on, uh, soil-borne diseases are the most important when it comes to diseases of garlic. So well-drained soil to avoid those diseases is very critical. There is Fusarium bulb rot and other rots that can happen. And of course, the most treasured part of, the, of, the, of garlic is the bulb, which is in the soil. So we need to be careful about drainage. The soil that, if your soil is clayey and rocky, that's probably not the best soils to have for um, garlic meaning you'll have to do some amendment with whatever 
um, uh, probably compost or manure, because you want to enrich the soil in organic matter. And then we also want it to be slightly acidic, pH 6 to 6.5. And that can be amended again if you do your soil test. And then you want full sun. So openness is critical. And if you are any homeowners back here who don't get full sun, that doesn't mean it won't grow, but you won't get as optimal growth as you would if you had an open area like, like that is that, that shown over there. And of course, if your soil is got poor drainage, raised beds um, can uh, deal with that problem. That's why we do the raised beds to improve on the drainage. And as we shall also uh, emphasize later on, we would like that you rotate garlic with other crops, especially if you encounter any diseases, uh, rotate with other crops. And we'll be talking about that later on. We'll also talk about cover cropping, cover crops, and we'll define what that is and the importance in production of garlic. Rotation and cover crops are useful because they discourage pests, diseases, and replenishment of the soil. And we'll see about that. Still on site selection, um, already mentioned that uh, eight hours of sunlight will be best. And this is a little bit of a repeat of what I just talked about, but down the um, the slide here, I've also talked about choosing the best cultivars suited to soil conditions. And I should also have said, and climate. Um, probably just described a few of those cultivars. It also goes with the taste. They also taste different. So um, all, all those things to consider. And we'll be talking about cover crops in a little while. There was a question that came from you, uh, one of you, about planting in containers. Um, yes, it's doable. The only thing is that you have to remember that it's going to be an eight month commitment in that container. You have to give water. In a container, you lose water much faster than on the ground, therefore, don't get tired of taking care of these uh, plants in, in containers. And if you have a limited amount of space in your backyard, you can, you can grow this uh, in your balcony because as you can see, you can use any size pot. And all you need is the materials that are given over there. Don't use soil, get high quality potting mix. It's much better. Uh, it's got uh, aeration and drainage is much better in potting mix and you have vermiculite and other spaces that allow water and air to freely move in the medium. And then you are planting material, make sure that it's healthy and we'll talk about that as well. And the, f the, f the bigger the better, uh, the, the cloves that is. And for some reason, I prefer to use slow release fertilizer, fertilizers, the, the, the composts and uh, other types of fertili compost, uh, fertilizers like that, as opposed to going to get the NPK, which is a fast release fertilizer. And the planting time for these uh, plants in containers should be the same time as in the field. And I'm going to spend like a minute on that. When do you actually, how do you time when to plant your cloves? About now in the area that I'm living in, Kankakee, just south of Chicago would be just about right. We are getting very close to, to that time. And the timing is both an intuition and a science. The idea being you want to start the cloves growing and they grow enough 
before the hard freeze and what is growing enough. Not quite definable, but there should be enough roots to anchor this bulb. And there is also a little shoot that has come through maybe just an inch above the surface, something like that. If it grows too long, that little shoot, if it's too long and the hard freeze comes, it kills it as opposed to when it is just a little tiny little thing. On the other hand, if you don't time it properly and it just grows a little bit and the hard frost comes, your root development didn't happen very well. And indeed, if you plant too close to the hard frost, you may end up with that one clove just developing a bulb that is just one clove. So it doesn't develop, doesn't form the different, the, the cloves, doesn't divide into the bulbules that will become the bulbs or the cloves in the bulb. So you run that risk. So do research in your area, find out when your hard frost is coming. Typically here in, in Kankakee or in this northern area, it should be about mid-October. So uh, it's a little late planting. Some people have already started planting, but you could still get something if you plant now. Keep your soil moist. Do not keep it soggy. These plants don't like extreme wetness. And I think I've made that point clear when I said you need good drainage. Crop rotation. Garlic may not require this crop rotation. I've been growing uh, garlic myself outside the extension office where I'm based every year and I haven't seen any issues. Same plot. I don't even bother with uh, raising the bed because the place is well drained. But it can require the uh, rotation if you see signs of disease or pests that like to thrive and live in the soil and disturb the bulbs. So you need to check on that. There is always some mixed feeling, by the way, about garlic following legumes. Some say that the legumes interfere with the growth of um, garlic. And I would like to see somebody do research on that. By the way, there is not so much of research with, with regard to garlic. Maybe it's an, a very easy crop to grow. But a legume like peas, that's probably great following uh, to follow, I mean, for garlic to follow peas. They just do fine. Therefore, if you're growing some beans, for instance, follow that with something else before you grow garlic and see what happens. There's also research by you growers. And in this slide, I have given you some three year crop rotations, which you can try out. Okay. Timing of planting, I guess I've already discussed this, but garlic is a long season overwintered crop and advanced planning is necessary. When four planted, garlic roots, roots develop and grow to a limited extent before the first hard freeze. And then in early spring, growth resumes and bulbs, uh, bulbs start developing. Eventually seed stalks form, which will become the skips. The tops then die down in early summer. On the other hand, spring, spring planted garlic requires what the fall garlic missed. The fall garlic went through a chilling period, which is called vernalization. That word vernalize there means went through that period of coldness, which induces the division or the development of bulb uh, use that will become the cloves. So if you're growing them in spring, you need to chill this um, garlic for a period of about eight weeks in the, in the fridge, about 32 degrees. 
Make sure they don't get dehydrated, have them in a Ziploc bag or something like that. So um, again, timing for North Run, Illinois, mid to late September, which probably is now. South Run, Illinois, plant through mid-October. It's warmer down there. Um, and and for, for North Run, Illinois, should, you should start doing it in September. But for Central Illinois, you need to do that mid to late September. It's a little bit warmer down there. Okay. Garlic is a great companion plant to go with others. And first of all, it's it's a it's a what is what is companion planting anyway? It's an excellent way for plants with mutually beneficial traits to support each other's growth. That is, if you plant crops in the same bed thoughtfully, surrounding vege vegetation will thrive or get some mutual benefit. Okay. So garlic is a great companion crop. One, it's a pest repellent. If you hit the smell of garlic, there are some insects that just don't like them, just like you don't. So it's a great pest repellent and examples have been, uh, I'll show some examples in a second. It's also a fungal repellent. Uh, garlic has sulfur in, its, in itself. And when the bulb is in the ground, the sulfur is a repellent or a suppressant of fungi that would otherwise affect the bulb. The third thing about garlic is that it attracts predatory and beneficial insects in the, uh, uh, and we shall see that in a minute. And maybe I go, let me go back here. Okay. So I've given you two lists here of what to grow it with. And it's the, the list is not exhaustive there who to grow with, but there are some plants you don't wanna grow it with. Some because they provide what we call a real pathy which means the extracts coming out of um, garlic prevent others from growing. And I've put question marks on, on pea, beans and peas because enough research has not been done to show whether they have an effect on the growth of beans, of, of garlic. Okay, let's talk a little bit about fertilization and then we'll talk about watering. So, James talked a little bit about the cover crops. He'll talk a little bit more in a minute, but a green cover crop or manure crop, uh, it tilled in to the garden a few weeks before planting is recommended to try and improve your soil physical properties. Garlic will not grow if, the, if nutrients are lacking. And so as a general recommendation for small gardens, apply three to four pounds of 10-10-10 fertilizer per 100 square feet, plus any organic matter, such as chopped leaves or compost added into the soil. But overall, it's probably best if you follow a, a soil test recommendation for your particular garden soil. So if you haven't grown garlic there before, it may be beneficial for you to get a soil test done so you can see what nutrients are in the soil already. So you don't over fertilize or under fertilize these garlic um, cloves when you plant them. So let's talk a little bit about nitrogen. So garlic responds well to increased nitrogen fertilization, but if too nitrogen rich, the garlic will have an abundance of vegetative top growth and very small bulbs. Excess nitrogen can also decrease the storage life of your garlic. When you're adding the nitrogen, do a split application of the fertilizer. Put about half to three quarters of the recommended nitrogen and put it into the soil and broadcast it and incorporate it in early fall just before planting. Nitrogen is mobile in the soil, so it will disappear by spring. 
Along with the nitrogen, you're going to add organic matter, such as oh, chopped leaves, uh, grass clippings, hopefully without weed seeds, maybe some sphagnum peat or a little bit of straw, whatever. A few weeks prior to planting the cloves. Or you can use a slow re release fertilizer in the fall, such as maybe alfalfa, cotton seed, or kelp meal. Um, Animal-based fertilizers, such as composted poultry litter, bone meal, or fish meal emulsions. Uh, there was a question earlier concerning uh, manures uh, planting with the garlic. You can do manures, such as horse and cow manures, the poultry litters, but make sure that it's well composted before you plant those bulbs. You don't want to use raw compost, I mean raw manures with that. The remainder of the nitrogen that you have should be top dressed in the spring after the shoots are about four to six inches tall. So top dressing means that you're just going to go ahead and apply it over the garlic uh, in the springtime so it can have a little bit of extra boost as it starts growing during that time. The bulbs will swell in response to lengthening daylight. So usually in May in most areas that's what's going to start happening. Don't fertilize after the plants have begun bulbing or when the scapes emerge, which is probably the better way of determining when those bulbs are starting to grow. So as uh, too much nitrogen while the bulbs are maturing can cause garlic to store poorly. I mentioned that before. When it comes to phosphorus and potassium, you want to take soil tests before planting to determine those levels and what needs or what additional supplements you need to add for those. You need to incorporate all the phosphorus and potassium fertilizers before planting. Symptoms of potassium deficient, uh, phosphorus deficiency <coughs> include dark green to purple leaves and stunted growth. Some of the symptoms for potassium deficiency include marginal scorching of the older leaves. Excuse me. Let's talk a little bit about watering. Garlic requires an even consistent supply of water. About one to two inches of water per week through irrigation <coughs> or rain events. Excuse me a second. Thank you. This will allow for uninterrupted growth. So you want about one to two inches of water per week. However, too much water will cause wet feet and may cause the bulb to rot. So research in California has shown that water stress during clove development has been implicated in witches, witch brooming and small cloves. So what's witches brooming? Which is brooming is where you're going to have a high quantity of dwarf cloves. You're going to get masses and masses of cloves, but they're not going to be usable at all. So any type of water stress may bring this on as well as those small cloves as well. So don't irrigate garlic once the tops begin to fall and become dry. You may need to protect the planting if you're getting a lot of rain in your area. So have some sort of way to protect that so the water doesn't seep in there and start rotting them. April and May is a critical period for diseases. Water early in the day so the garlic plant can be dry by nightfall, thereby reducing the chance of disease. You wanna make sure that you water thoroughly after planting to stimulate the growth in the fall or spring if you plant in the spring. The soil must be kept evenly moist as dry soil will cause small irregularly shaped bulbs. Heavy clay soils will create small and misshaped bulbs as well and will make harvesting very difficult. If planted in soils with poor drainage, the bulb can succumb to root and bulb rot. So you may want to add a little bit of organic matter, such as the manure or compost, to the soil on a yearly basis to keep it friable or, or break apart easily. So it's easier to try and do a harvest at that time. James? 
weight control. <clears throat> so, as, as you can see on uh, the slide here, garlic is a very poor competitor among its weeds. And you need to be on top of garlic, especially in, in spring, to make sure that none of the appearing weeds establish themselves beyond a certain height because they start taking away just too much of nutrients, rob the nutrients that would otherwise have benefited garlic. <clears throat> and you can remove, and I guess for backyard gardens or smaller gardens out there, you can use a hoe, a trowel, or pull the weeds and with weeding, you gotta be careful if you're using an implement. Garlic is very shallow rooted. You, you might injure the roots or you might even injure the developing bulb. So take care, be careful here. Some people have also used the wheel hole that uh, walk behind wheel hole and they say it works very well in between the rows at least. So that helps. My best solution when it comes to weed control is to use straw. Every time I grow um, garlic, I ensure that I got some cheap straw, buy some cheap straw and just spread two to three inches of straw. And that in itself keeps the field clean. You can see the picture there, you know, you stay quite a little ways before you see a whole lot of weeds coming through. There are also people who try to do smothering of weeds. So there are people when planting who overlay the beds with plastic. That keeps the weeds down. I still prefer mulching with straw or leaves because this is compost in itself, eventually, as opposed to uh, non-organic stuff like uh, plastic. So basically, I think if you put down enough straw, you'll be okay with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with, uh, with the weeds. Did I, did I okay. And we in, in <clears throat> at the University of Illinois have had two people now trying to use oats as cover crops. What is a cover crop? A cover crop is just what it, that says. It's a crop that covers the ground when you don't have anything else growing. We are copying mother nature when there's nothing on ground and the conditions for growth are optimal. She will grow something. It's the same thing we are doing and that prevents soil erosion. It prevents uh, nutrient loss to, to, to leaching water. Um, it has benefits. It, it has benefits, and what you grow there becomes green manure in the in the long in the long term. And two of my colleagues here have tested oats. You know, grow oats early in in August, then in late September, as we saw, or mid September, grow your plant your garlic in the oats, and come December when the temperatures are in the teens, the oat dies, it's winter killed. And that's what you see in the picture there to the right and left of the garlic is some leaves, but there's also grass. That's oats which have been winter killed. And the other person that I know who did this experiment had more oats than you're seeing right here, more oat crop. And that in itself becomes a cover for the soil and the soil is kept free from freezing. And when it is not frozen, it will not heave. You know, because of water freezing in the soil, soil heaves. And what that does to the developing roots is that they break. So there's damage to the plant. So the oats uh, become a cover crop in the first place, which is good practice. Number two, they become uh, a cover that stops the soil from freezing. 
and next year as they decompose, it's organic matter for the soil. So there are three good, and then suppressing, of course, that suppresses weeds as well because there's a cover. So oats are cheap, but anybody can buy those cheaply. So um, I recommend that you consider using oats if you're going to go into cover crops and you don't want to use straw. And there are other cover crop options, of course. If you have very sandy soil and you want rapid growth, try buckwheat. Buckwheat is very rapid in its growth and before you plant your garlic in the fall, it will give you all the benefits of a cover crop. Um, if, we, if you still want to try a, a cover crop, winter rye is something you can try right now because it's, first of all, it likes cool weather. Actually, it's keen when it comes to cold weather, when it comes to growing. It can, it can grow right now. But it is a little pathic, doesn't affect garlic, it affects vegetables. If you're going to grow other vegetables, wait two weeks after killing it in spring, so that the effects or the extracts that came from the winter rye can move away. Alfalfa is a legume, so in addition to being another summer annual, it will, uh, uh, it will also fix nitrogen. It's an excellent nitrogen fixer, so again, you get an advantage over there. And I also included a little thing there. If you want to check the temperature of your soils, you go to the National Weather Service and just simply Google National Weather Service soil temperature. Our soils here in Kankaki, we refer to what we are given by a township called Stell. And as two days ago, I checked and at four inches, it was 63 inches. You can be sure that the top one inch is not 63, it's colder than that because the ambient temperature has been less than that. I just thought I would put that there for your, for your knowledge. Pests and diseases. If your core crops have been visited quite often by insects such as cabbage loopers, well, that's a worm when it's a looper, but it's brought by a butterfly, or the cabbage diamond back moth, or some other worms that we see, imported cabbage worm, those, those worms. If you interplant these crops, the core crops, with garlic, these insects, most of them, not all of them, some, most of them will be, will be repelled, all right? However, never say never, or well, before I say what I wanted to say, garlic will also keep away bigger critters, the raccoons and the rabbits and the deer, uh, well, the bigger, bigger critters would be the deer and somebody also, a grower says they were able to keep the moose out of their garden. Now, uh, so grow your, grow your crops with the garlic. Diseases also appear. The most important thing as far as diseases is concerned is to not, to not get your soil overly wet because that's how you get the rots and other opportunistic fungi. Now, if you're unsure of the health of the bulb, bulbs that you're planting, do an antifungal dip in bleach. Simply uh, dilute the bleach 10 times and dip them in there for a few minutes. Let them drip for a few minutes and then plant those, get the cloves and plant those. So good sanitation, good soil condition and crop rotation will keep most of these challenges, insect pests and diseases away. Okay, uh, the last thing we're gonna be talking about is harvesting, curing and storage of your garlic. So you've spent all last fall, you planted your garlic, you babied it through, it came through the winter, yay! and now you are ready to start harvesting it. So depending on the area where you live in, garlic will be ready to harvest like from late May to the end of July. 
A lot of it has to do with where you live and the cultivar that you're growing. So make sure that you do your research on this before you actually plant the garlic. When garlic is mature and ready to harvest, the leaf tops will begin to dry, they'll discolor, and they'll bend towards the ground. Harvest the garlic when one third to half of the leaves have died back in this manner. Check one or two bulbs to make sure that the crops are ready before doing a full harvest. So the bulb size itself is not necessarily the best criterion of maturity. So you wanna pull some bulbs from the ground and cut them across the cloves to see if the cloves have filled and the skin covering the bulbs or the scaled tunics, is what it's called, that it should be dry and papery. Now, in order to harvest your garlic, you don't wanna just pull them up from the stem. You wanna use a pitchfork to loosen the soil and that will help to facilitate lifting the bulbs. So you'll reduce the stem injury that you're going to have when you start removing them from the soil itself. So don't pull by the stalk as it will separate from the bulb. And this is especially important if you plan to braid the tops. So if harvesting is delayed too long after the tops have died back, the bulbs may rot. So remove the dirt with the fingers, do not wash them. Tie the plants in a bundle of six to eight and then hang in a shaded, dry, well-ventilated shed or garage to cure. You can also lay them on the ground for about two to three weeks if you wanna do it that way. Um, and so make sure that if you do lay them on the ground that you have a reduction in uh, rain events that's going to happen on this. So you don't want it to rain if they're sitting on the ground. So make sure you keep them dry. Okay, so for curing the garlic, uh, you wanna cure for about two to four weeks at about 75 to 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And you wanna have low humidity for this. Again, you can lay the harvested bulbs on the surface, but if it's, if it's gonna be dry and mild, uh, as long as two weeks, but don't do it if rain is forecasted. If you're braiding the soft neck garlic, allow the tops to wilt for about two to three days and then braid very tightly and allow to finish curing. Tight braids are necessary as the stems will shrink while they're drying. So you wanna have it nice and tight. If you're not braiding, trim the tops to about two inches long and the roots to about a quarter inch after the bulbs have cured. If moisture is still felt in the stem as you're cutting them, then you wanna to continue to cure the bulbs for a few more days and then check again. Soft neck garlic takes longer to cure as there are more rows of cloves in each bulb. Leave the outer paper covering on to reduce moisture loss. So when you're storing your garlic, different varieties are gonna store differently. So again, you're gonna to have to do your research depending on the cultivar that you're growing. The soft neck store better than hard neck. Commercial growers store at about 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Generally a temperature of less than 45 degrees Fahrenheit in a dry, well-ventilated place and in a well-ventilated container such as a mesh bag is recommended. When exposed to warmer temperature, garlic tends to sprout. Uh, depending on who you talk to, I don't store my garlic long term in the refrigerator as it may be too humid and too warm for them. And it may start sprouting when you don't want them to. Once the bulbs are in storage, check every few days to see if any have sprouted. Remove those and use them right away. Storage life, two to five months or more, depending on the type and the cultivar. You want about 45 to 60% relative humidity. Reserve your healthiest bulbs for replanting the next season. If saving bulbs for the next year, don't separate the cloves until one to two days prior to planting. So keep them as a full bulb rather than dividing them out into cloves. For seed garlic, if you're planting seed garlic, it should be stored at about oh, 45 degrees Fahrenheit with relative humidity about 65-70%. 
Remember, cloves will sprout at about 50 degrees, so keep an eye on them when they're in storage. And these are just some of the resources that we have on this. Um, the uh, uh, garlic for small commercial growers, if you are a commercial, I know we have a few commercial growers on, on the line with us today. Uh, that's a really good uh, resource for you to do. University of Illinois has uh, some information on Watch Your Garden Grow, which includes garlic as well as other vegetables. And James, you want to talk about the vegetable gardening in the Midwest? Um, the Upper Midwest garlic growers have formed a, what would you call it, a, a fraternity of sorts. And they have a blog, or they have a, an interactive website where people talk about everything questions, uh, experiences, you know, um, sources of growing material, anybody who has started to sell. So it's a nice place to be, to be in if you're growing garlic or just join them and see what kind of information they have. Yep, and the upper Midwest garlic growers. Oh, and then uh, the vegetable gardening in the Midwest by Chuck Voigt. It's a notebook, we still hope, well, we hope that they have an updated uh, version of that publication there, but that's probably not too much of information. I wouldn't, okay. I wouldn't, yeah, yeah. All right. So uh, our information is here. Feel free to write to us. Uh, we will be taking questions in just a moment. Um, so our, our contact information is there. Um, one other thing that I wanted to mention is that we, we did have people write in and, and ask questions prior to, and, and we did get quite a few people wanting some information or additional information concerning recipes and how to deal and work with garlic. And so the University of Illinois Extension has a really good website. It's called Eat, Move, and Save. And it talks about garlic and it has specifically for that connection uh, URL down at the bottom. Um, it has recipes, uh, foods grown, eating tips, food safety, all of this has to do with garlic. And when we're talking about food safety, we mentioned the concerns with using raw manure when planting your garlic, you really don't want to do that. But the other thing that I see a lot is people that grow the garlic and then put it into an oil itself, into a bottle of oil, so the garlic can, the garlic chemicals can seep into the oil itself. Um, the problem with doing something like this would be there is a, always a chance of the garlic and the oil not being food safe and being able to use it because of uh, the potential for botulism to grow within that oil itself. So this is something that I would not recommend at this time. Um, putting garlic into an oil and have it steep for a while. Uh, James, have you looked? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say, are we going on to the questions now? Yes. Uh -huh. We've got quite a number of questions in the chat box. And I had started answering some, and I would also like your input. Can you plant garlic in a pot outside and will it overwinter well? My answer there was yes. As long as you make sure you cover the soil properly so that it doesn't freeze. And we talked about the heaving element, which will damage the bulbs. What might you say? Would you agree with that? Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, so All right. As long as the, the roots don't freeze, yeah, you can keep them yeah. protected outside. And then the next question. So I can plant garlic now where tomatoes were harvested? And I said yes. I don't see why not. Just make sure that you, uh, you know, the tomatoes have also taken nutrients out of the soil itself. So if you are planting directly into where the tomatoes were, you may want to incorporate some uh, nitrogen uh, it, itself so the bulbs have something to start growing with before winter sets in. So make sure you, you adjust your fertilizer on that. And then Jean has asked this one, you can answer this one, have warm casts been tried as fertilizer? Oh yeah, oh yeah. Oh, okay. uh, 
I have used worm casts in my garden. They work very well as a fertilizer, as an organic type of fertilizer. Um, they do release a lot of nutrients for the plants. Yes, definitely. Didn't quite understand uh, Cheryl's question. Will there be a printout so fast? Ah, yes, there will be a handout. Uh, you will receive, in fact, um, you should have a survey in your mailbox at this time for uh, an evaluation for this. So for those that joined us late, please complete the survey. And if you are interested in getting a, a copy of the handout, let me know when you return the survey and I will send one to you. And I love what Patsy just wrote there, that she will plant her garlic in last year's bean bed and the same variety in a garden right next to it and has oats growing as a cover crop. Will be interesting to see how they grow. And Patsy, if you can share your results with us, that would be awesome. We're always looking for that kind of information. Yep. And then how close together can you plant garlic? The bigger they are, the farther away they ought to be. The recommendation is four to six inches with ordinary size, with the ordinary size uh, clothes. But when it comes to uh, the elephant variety, elephant garlic, then you've got to go a bit wider than that, bigger than that, more than six inches, or at least six inches, because they are bigger. That's, you gotta space them out. Between rows, again, you can go half a foot to a foot. Again, depending on the variety you're growing, if you're growing the elephant garlic, you might as well do one foot at least, minimum. Got something else you wanna say? No, um, I plant my music garlic uh, three inches apart uh, in the fall. So yeah, okay. good, good recommendation. My apologies if I missed it. Is and Pracnos in garlic new to our Illinois. My garlic had it for the first time last year. Um, I don't think it's new. Anthracnose is one of those opportunistic fungi in the soil, soil born. And I don't know much about it. Maybe you do. Uh, uh, no, but I know that anthracnose is, is a, a concern in garlic itself. It is not new in Illinois. We've, I have seen it in the past. Uh, it's just something that you uh, can do a little bit of research on uh, to be able to control based on uh, where you're at, what type of chemicals you want to use, or if you're trying to go organic. Uh, feel free to contact one of us if you can't find anything, either James or myself, and we can help you with that research on that. And the, the question that Kathy has asked I was going to ask myself, does anyone who is local have their own to share or sell? Um, uh, Kathy runs a small community garden. Please, anybody who has some, please uh, write in the chat box there. And I think, let, let's talk about something we didn't, I probably didn't mention. Can you grow uh, garlic that is just store-bought? You can try. Mm -hmm. The hope would have to be that they have not treated it with bleach or something else that prevents it from sprouting yeah. in the store while in storage. Yeah. But yeah, try. I think I have tried and it worked. So yeah, it depends on on the the garlic that you buy. I know that uh, some people have had fairly good results with it, but the majority of commercial growers, like for the uh, California earlier, the California whites that you see in the grocery store, they're generally treated uh, with a chemical to stop the sprouting because that garlic can sit in the grocery store under those lights for maybe two, three, four weeks before they're bought. And so they don't want them sprouting in the store. So they can be treated. So that can be a concern. Can be a mission. Can garlic be grown indoors in planters? My answer is yes. As long as they've been freeze, they have been vinylized, as long as they have been chilled, I don't see why they can't grow. Yep. That's my answer. Yep. Um, thank you, Patsy, for, for willing to share information that you're going to develop. Stala Muhammad, novice gardener, after planting and watering, when the weather begins to cool, and we head into winter, 
we then stop watering and then resume after the first frost in spring. And for quality, do we need to cover our garlic with the straw over the winter? Let me answer the second part of that question. Yes, yes you do. You need to cover your garlic with straw over the winter because if the ground freezes, it heaves and with the heaving, with the pushing up, that breaks the roots, exposes the bulb. I mean, you don't want that. So yes, you have to cover that with something. Straw is better because as my friend Doug noted, when you use leaves and the wind is blowing, the weeds get blown off easily, but not straw. So yes, you need to cover that. When do you stop watering? Uh, okay, so when you plant your garlic and you know that if the weather's gonna start cooling and you're heading into winter, you know that hopefully, <laughs> depending on where you live, is that you're gonna get these fall rains, right? Well, sometimes these rains don't occur. So if you get a raining event or a rain event on a somewhat regular basis, then I wouldn't do any extra watering. The problem with planting the garlic in the fall is that you want them to create the root system and become established before uh, winter sets in. And so if you get a dry fall and you don't get any rain, then yes, you should probably go ahead and water those, especially if you have fertilizer in the soil itself. If you put the fertilizer in, uh, the same time you put the garlic in, then that fertilizer is sitting there. Um, and as the, start, as the roots start to grow, that fertilizer can burn those tiny root systems that are coming out, depending on what you use. So uh, as it starts to cool off in the winter, you don't have to water if you're getting the irrigation. But if it's dry and the soil is dry going into November or the end of October and November, yes, please water them. Get them established before that. And then you're going to resume your watering in the springtime. And you'll notice that, um, well, recently I know in my area we get a lot of rain in the springtime. So if you don't get any rain in the spring, then yes, you'll need to start watering them. Uh, you'll remove the mulch. Uh, the straw or whatever you put over there and take a look at the plants. If you see them start to grow, you'll see new green growth on the top. You know that they're actively in the growth process and so they will need water. But again, you don't want to overwater. So it's kind of a, a give and take type of thing. Good question. Yes. Straw, not hay. Is that correct? This is Kathy asking. Yeah, straw. The seed has already been harvested because the wheat is gone. The wheat seed is gone. So we only have the, 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 the stems, okay? With hay, you're bringing in a lot of seed, most likely. So again, you're bringing weeds. And then straw is cheaper than hay. So go with straw. That will be the better choice. Mm -hmm. All right. Did, you, did I mention how deep to bury the crops? I me, I just go with one inch, one to two inches. And I think, I think that's a recommendation. Is that correct? Uh, Oli? Yes, three to four inches is what I recommend. Okay. I've always done less and it still works, but. Yep. And so it's, it's, it's going to depend on the bowl clove itself. Yeah. So yeah. The smaller, this way after the smaller cloves are going to be uh, planted a little bit closer to the, to the top. And the oh, Yeah, okay. Very well, very well. And so with the, uh, uh, su uh, the survey, you should have it in the mailbox. I will check on it. Someone said that it's not there yet. So I will double check and make sure that it is sent, but please look for it and help us uh, to evaluate the presentation and give us some suggestions for next year or next year. All right. So I, if, I keep, if we keep going with your questions, uh, is that the first one? Where is the first? Okay. So there was a question oh, concerning growing garlic in the tropics. And so what I'm thinking the tropics is probably uh, maybe the equator. <laughs> 
Um, so the vernalization is what's going to be the concern with your garlic bulbs, especially if you're growing it into an environment that never gets cold treatment. So these garlic bulbs, as James mentioned, need to be vernalized or cold treated before they can be planted. Um, so the vernalization that we have for our areas, we talked about already, but for the tropics where there's not gonna be any cold at all, um, this was a tough one because I was looking for research on this and there's very little research done on growing them in higher, uh, hotter zones than what we are used to here in the United States. Um, so I found a farm that was down in the Costa Rica area um, that had been growing garlic for four years and each year he was learning something new. So he started with two to four weeks in um, vernalization and it didn't seem to work. Well after his third year he's saying 10 to 12 weeks. So depending on where you live and what type of garlic you're trying to grow, that vernalization period is really going to make a difference if you are growing in a zone, you know, higher than 10 or down in uh, South America or, or someplace near the equator. Okay, so I think we've kind of touched on the second question there. And then can garlic be grown from seed? And the answer is there, if, you want, if you're willing to wait two to three years, it will grow. Yep. Preventing, sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, preventing mite damage. Um, rotation. These critters, these fellows like to live in the soil. So if you have mite damage or you had mite damage last year, don't plant in the same place. They are still waiting. They are there waiting. And then there was uh, associated question there. Brown lesions on field clothes. Now, when you get that kind of correlation, it could be due to a few factors. And let me just give you one. If you had thrips, which is another insect that sucks uh, juice from the leaves and the, and the bulb itself, but in addition also scrapes the, the bulbs, those openings become avenues for infestation by soil-borne pathogens. And so if you have some browning there, it could be due to infection by a secondary uh, infection. So when it is put, it put like that, it could be a few things that ha happen there. So rotate, rotation is a big thing. Soil balancing and preparation needs for garlic, I think, talked quite a bit about fertilizer, right? Yes. Okay, yep. so let's go to the next one. Next slide. Organic garlic bulbs to plant. Well, the best place to go is to online. There's a lot of uh, dealers online, uh, especially if you're looking at Johnny Selected Seeds, They're, they have good organic. Baker Creek heirloom seed, if you're looking for heirloom garlic, that's another one. Seedsavers.org, burpees, among others. And so there's a lot of, of resources online that you can go to. Generally, uh, some good ones for organic would be uh, the Baker, the Seed Savers, and Johnny Selected Seeds. Then does, uh, what can be planted? Okay. Go ahead. What can be planted in a raised bed that isn't a full, in full sun anymore? Um, tomatoes. Tomatoes will do well in partial shade. Six hours, five hours, they, it, they'll, do, they'll do quite fine. And by the way, it does not mean that garlic will not grow. It's just that you will not get the big bulb that you would otherwise get if it was full sun. Nice. So you can still grow it there, except don't expect a big one. I don't know what else you can grow in partial shade. Yeah, most okay. vegetables require full sun, so that can right. be kind of hard. We talked about hard neck and soft necks, how to start growing in containers. Next slide. 
containers and if garlic really keeps pests away from roses yes put some roses around your yes aphids are terrible when it comes to roses and mites are also bad so yeah plant some gar uh, garlic around your roses that will help how to ensure garlic bulbs grow to the largest potential when to plant when to pick scapes of soil nutrients when to harvest i think we we, we went through all that yep uh-huh where can i get good garlic to plant again that's yep, yep. Um, differences when in northern illinois versus central or southern illinois the ecological zones are different and the, uh, the, the garlic the south, differ as well so yeah hard neck and soft neck right our, well, I don't know about soils. We have very clay soils in most of Northern Illinois and more, I quite a bit of central as well. And then of course the warmth of the different places. Yep. Recipes, that was for you. Yep, uh, I showed that little website from University of Illinois yes. Extension. They have some really good recipes on there. Okay. We do have a couple more questions in the chat box. Um, how should oh, how should the vermicompost be applied? Well, the, you're going to apply it just like putting it into the ground and then incorporating it into the soil itself. So that would be the best way to do it. Uh, do it, I would probably apply the vermicompost maybe or a week before or two weeks prior to planting the garlic cloves themselves. Um, but you just apply vermicomposting just like you would any other organic matter. Should straw Jean, be removed? Jean, yeah. Go ahead. Should straw? Oh, I was just going to tell. I was just going to tell Jean. You remove the straw and you invite the weeds, and then you you have to water more. Yeah, no, leave it right there. Yeah. Leave it right there. Just make sure it's not a thick mulch. So if you have a really thick mulch over the winter, especially if you're in the northern areas and you have like three or four inches of mulch, you don't want to have that much in the spring, because having that much mulch it does two things. Number one, it keeps the soil moist, which can cause rotting of the bulb, it's uh, the cloves themselves, um, and it can uh, uh, cause some diseases and some uh, rotting uh, of the plant itself. So you need to be really careful of that. And the second thing is that the too much mulch will reduce the amount of air that gets into the soil. And so the roots don't do very well if there's less air pockets in the soil. So believe it or not, soil is alive. It does breathe and it does require oxygen in there in order for the plants to grow. And you've reminded me something else. If it is too thick, then you have to be out there guiding the shoots to come through that thickness. So yeah, less is better than more. Yep. Agreed. All right, I did check on the evaluation or the survey. Uh, for those that registered um, later, uh, that survey will be sent to you this evening. Um, so please look for it in your mailbox. Uh, other than that, there's our contact information. Feel free to contact us or write to us if you have any questions. And again, I want to thank everybody for joining us today. You've been a great audience, a lot of great questions for us. and. Uh, we hope to see you at our next webinar. I appreciate, or James and I both appreciate you joining us today. Thank you very much.